I'm just waiting for the recording to start. All right. Uh, so you should presumably all be here for category theory. I don't know why anyone else would be in this room at this time. Um, so you all know my name is Evo Vekermans. And my email is that at anu.edu.au. Um, this is going to run for four weeks. Uh, the first week or two, I would say, is probably going to be pretty slow. Um, so if you know some of this stuff already, it might be a while before we get to new material for you. Um, I want to do lots of examples of things. So today, we will just be talking about what a category is and seeing examples of it and seeing maybe some adjectives that you can assign, uh, that you can add to categories. Um, what else? Uh, my office is uh, 255 in this building. Um, and I think probably about the hour mark, we'll have a short break and then get started again. And I think at the end of the, at the end of the today, we'll, um, at, at around noon, we'll um, have a discussion about actually what we're going to be doing with the three hour blocks um, that I've booked this room for. Because I don't know that I want to stand up here and talk for three hours, three times a week. Um, all right, oh, this is being recorded. I think that was clear. Uh, so these will be on my YouTube channel, which were in the email that I sent out. Um, I might edit them slightly. I, I'm not sure. All right, so <coughs> um, first, we want to define what a category is, because we are talking about categories. So a category, uh, which is denoted lots of ways, but for like a generic category, you'll often see math cal C um, consists of, all right. So you have, how many pieces of information you say this is sort of depends on how you choose to, to say what things are. But you have objects, uh, which we're mostly going to denote by capital letters, so say x, y, z. Um, people will write in ob c, or sometimes they'll even just leave out this, and they'll just write in C. And it should be clear from context that you're talking about objects. Uh, this is a bit misleading, because the collection of objects in a category doesn't need to form a set. It can just be like a class. For example, there is a category of sets. And there is not a set of all sets. Um, all right. Next, we have morphisms. Uh, which we'll mostly denote by low, lowercase letters or things that you usually denote functions by. Um, so morphisms go from objects to objects. So say morphism from x to y. Um, <coughs> and then we would call this the domain of f, and this the codomain of f. Mm. F, and I promised I would myself I would write big so that the recording could see it, and I've already started writing small. Great. Um, you'll also hear the words source and target for domain and codomain, respectively. Um, you might hear arrows, uh, morphisms called arrows. It doesn't really matter, it's just a word. Uh, and <coughs> depending on who you talk to, there's another requirement on the morphisms, which is that, uh, so you have morphisms, you have a set of morphisms. Uh, for each pair of objects. Um, so in this case, the pair is x and y. Uh, and we'll denote that set by cxy, where c is a category, or by hom xy. Um, and 
this doesn't have any information about what category we're in, and if it's not clear from context, or if you're dealing with multiple categories, you'll put the name of the category down here in the bottom. Um, so saying that this has to be a set is um, actually a condition on categories called being locally small. Most mathematicians will use this definition of, will use this as a requirement for something being a category. It's really only hardcore category theorists who use the term locally small at all. Um, all right. Now, we still need some more information, so <coughs> can people see? Um, for each triple of objects, uh, we have a function that, which I'm going to denote by the composition symbol, that goes from, so the triple will be x, y, z. And we'll go from y maps from y to z across maps from x to y to maps from x to z. All right, and this is just um, because these are sets, this is just the Cartesian product of sets. Uh, and this is going to take. Um, G, the pair GF to some map in here called G composed with F. And the point is that whenever you have two, um, when you have, whenever you have such a pair, there has to exist such a map so that that's true. Um, so uh, really, we have a, a diagram here that's like, uh, X, so we do F, and then we do G, and that gives us G composed with F. And to be honest, I'm going to drop this composition symbol pretty soon. It's kind of annoying, and it's un like it's just unnecessary. It should be clear from context when you're composing two morphisms. <coughs> All right. Uh, now, these things need to satisfy some um, conditions. So all this satisfying. All right. Uh, so I'm going to just write here that this is composition. Unfortunately, there's something going on in the seminar room for like most of the break, uh, or various things going on, so I couldn't book it. Uh, so my handwriting is not great on whiteboards, um, and it would be better if we could use chalk. But here we are. <coughs> All right, so <coughs> now I want to say that um, for each object, there is a distinguished morphism, uh, which you might see denoted as 1x. So the object here, we're going to use x. Uh, or idx. I think I mostly will use idx, um, but it's the same thing, which is in the maps from x to x, such that um, it acts as the identity. So if I have um, some x to y, as I have some morphism from x to y. If I do the identity on x first, that's still f. And if I do the identity on y, so if I pre-compose with the identity on x, I still get f. If I post-compose with the identity on y, I still get f. I d y, this map is still f. Um, so when I draw these diagrams, um, 
And I'm sort of not saying that they're commutative diagrams, but if I draw a diagram and it's not a commutative diagram, I will tell you it's not a commutative diagram. Um, by drawing these diagrams, what I'm saying is that any, 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 for any pair of paths going from one place to, to another place, those two paths are equal. So in this case, I'm saying that uh, this, this sort of triangle here says that IDX composed with F is F, and um, IDY composed with F is F. Um, and this says that, well, this says that G composed with F is G composed with F. Because we're, when, when I'm doing this, I'm saying that we can define such a thing. <coughs> All right, so we have identities. And then, that would be better. Um, yeah. So, and then finally, we have um, that. And finally, composition is associative. What does that say? That says that, um, well, really, I should do this with a diagram. That says that if I have three morphisms that compose, it doesn't matter which pair I compose first, basically. Uh, so if I have w, how do I do this? x, y, and z, and I have the map here, f, and I have the map here, G, I have a map here, H, then what it says is that this diagram commutes. So this is G composed with H, uh, F, and this is uh, H composed with G. And so what this is saying is that um, H composed with G composed with F, this is the same thing as H composed with G composed with F. <coughs> All right, so the point of this definition is that it somehow generalizes a lot of what mathematicians care about. Um, and it gives you, it, it sort of fixes mathematical contexts that you, that you work in. Um, there's also a big focus on morphisms, and one of the key lessons of category theory is that when you're working in some mathematical context, usually the thing that really matters is how a given object relates to every other object in the category. Um, and now we're just going to see a bunch of examples. All right. <coughs> so <coughs> examples. Uh, so to describe a category, what do we need? We need to know what the objects are. We need to know what the morphisms are. Uh, we need to know what the identities are. And we need to know how composition works. Actually, I probably should have composition the other way around. Let's. So we want to know what composition is, and we want to know what the identities are. All right. So our first example, I'm going to call R underline. The objects of R underline are real numbers. The morphisms, so. What I want to do is I want to give a set for each pair of objects here. Uh, so I'm going to say, um, oh, no, let's use, let's use this notation. So maps from 
some real number to some other real number is going to be the set containing one element. And I'm going to call this uh, iota xy. Um, if x is less than or equal to y, and it's going to be empty if x is greater than y. So what's composition here? Well, to have two morphisms that we can compose, we need to have that the codomain of one of them is the same as the domain of the second one. Um, so if we have uh, f from x to y and g from y to z, then uh, this tells us that x is less than or equal to y, and y is less than or equal to z. And by transitivity, um, x is less than or equal to z. And there is a unique such morphism. Um, and so composition sort of is forced to be the only thing it can be. Uh, all right, and what's the identity? Well, again, there's only one morphism from uh, x to itself, because x is less than or equal to itself. And that's the identity. And if you want to see that that's the identity, we'll say that, OK, you've got this map from x to x, and you have a map from x to y. And this is the identity on x. And this is iota xy. Well, that composes to something. But there's only one map from x to y, and it has to compose to iota xy. So in particular, iota xy composed with the identity on x is iota xy. So it is the identity, and you can check that it's the identity on the other side as well. <coughs> All right. So that's our first example. Uh, our next example, um, ooh, what should I call this? Uh, I'm going to call this div n plus. This is not standard notation. Yes. Um, for it, well, the point is that it is an identity. So shouldn't we be, shouldn't we be checking like the identity of that? No, no. The, the, I've I've proven that composing the identity with a map gives back that say the map, the other map, which is the point of an identity. So you, what is that? I I mean it's iota x x. It's the unique, it's the, because there's only one map from x to itself. It's the only thing it can be. So we, the only thing we had to check was that iota xx satisfies the properties of an identity, which is um, this, basically. So I checked one of those conditions. You still seem unsatisfied. It seems like that's not the same as that condition. That's um, I mean, the point is there has to exist such an identity. And like, I checked this one, saying this diagram commutes is saying this. Oh, no, I checked the other one. I checked this one. This recording is going to be great. Um, <coughs> hey, everybody. Are you happy with that? Uh, All right. Um, OK, so I'm going to write this for this category, because I didn't come up with a good name for it, and then I forgot. So the objects here are positive natural numbers. Um, and we're going to have that. Oh, all right. This is going to get a bit messy. All right. Uh, the home sets between, say, M and N, that's, yes, um, are going to be the same, similar. Um, so I'm going to have D M N if M divides N, and it's going to be empty if M does not divide N. Uh, so for similar reasons to this, the composition is unique. Um, 
And I'm about to talk about how these two are actually the, the same setup, so I'm not going to go into that. I'm just going to write this is unique composition. Because there's only one map between any two things. So if you have one in the middle, then there's still only one map between the two outer things. So composition is sort of uniquely defined. Um, and similarly, um, uh, the identity here has to be DMM for the same reasons that that's true up there. And so if we want to generalize this, let P be a partially ordered set or a post set, then we take, we will call our category P underline. And our objects are going to be elements of our partially ordered set. Our morphisms are going to be, well, there's going to be something there if, uh, oh, the notation. Um, so if. There's going to be a map from y, x to y if x is less than or equal to y in our partial order, and it's going to be empty otherwise. And again, we get uniqueness here for composition, because if I have a map from x to y, to z, this map has to be fxy, and this map has to be fyz. And it has to compose to something, but there's only one thing it can compose to, because there's only one map between x and z, and that's going to be fxz. All right, and what's the identity here? Again, the identity has to be. Um, the identity on x has to be fxx, because, well, I'll do the other way now. If I have a map w to x, that's going to be f from w to x. And then I have um, fxx. Well, there's only one map from w to x. This has to compose to something, so it has to compose to fwx. And so fxx composed with fwx is fwx. And that's the other condition that I wanted this to satisfy. <coughs> so actually proving that a given poset is a, forms a category in this way is the same regardless of what relation you use for your poset, for your partial order. All right. Uh, now let's see something different. So, all right, I'm going to annoyingly use an underline to not mean the thing with the partial order on it, um, and you'll just have to suck it. Uh, so. What are the objects? Well, this category is going to have one object. And I'm just going to call it that. That's the only object in this category. So it's this, and it has one object. <coughs> All right, what are the morphisms? Well, I only need to tell you what this is, because it's the only object. So the only morphisms are from it to itself. And the morphisms, so this contains functions of the form, and I'm going to call them phi a, which go from the natural numbers to the natural numbers, and they send, some, they send a natural number x to x plus a. All right, so what's composition here? Composition here is, well, you can compose any two of the functions, because any two of the morphisms, because they're all from the same object to itself. So you can just keep composing them. Uh, and composition is going to be phi a composed with phi b equals 
by, let's see, uh, a plus b. Is that right? Yes. It's not clear to me whether it wasn't clear to me whether it should be b plus a or a plus b, but it's a b plus it's a plus b. All right. Yes, they are all going from star to star. They are all as morphisms going from star to star. This is not this is not where it's going from as a morphism. So as a morphism, so I'm saying that this is a function, and I'm abusing notation here by giving these the same names somehow. There is some abuse going on. Um, both of my voice and of notation. Um, <coughs> all right, so this is for, um, and the, there's one of these for, for, or for each natural number. You have such a thing. All right, and so what's the identity here? The identity is v0. And you can check that if you compose with something with, with, with one of these on either side, you get back the thing, because a natural number plus 0 is that same natural number. All right, but yeah, this is an important point. The point is that these are morphisms from star to star, not from n to n. All right, so that's another example of a category. And we can generalize from this again. And we're going to say, let M be a monoid. So hopefully everyone knows what a monoid is. Uh, it's not quite a group. It has a multi it's a set with a multiplication and an identity for that multiplication, but no inverses. Oh, and the multiplication is associative, because that's a thing people insist on saying, even though what's the point of a non-associative non multiplication? I'm kidding a bit. There are useful places where that's. All right, so what's the object in M underline? So here I've used this underline thing for a post set, and I've used it for a monoid. And again, you just have to deal with that. Um, all right, so the object here is, again, star. Um, and the morphisms from star to star Well, this is a set, remember. So in fact, this is just M. So really, what, I've, what I'm saying here is that it's, uh, it's, this should actually be the natural numbers, this, this set of morphisms. Um, and by, by describing them as functions, I'm telling you how the composition should work. So you have one object. You have a morphism for each element in the set because the monoid starts off as a set. And then composition, so A composed with B is A times B in the monoid. Uh, and then the identity, well, monoids have identity elements. And so you have an identity morphism. <coughs> All right. And these two things, this poset and monoid construction, are somehow the like fundamental uh, are somehow fundamental things. This is a category with lots of objects, like like a poset category for a large poset is is a category with lots of objects, but at most one arrow between them. And a monoid category is a category with one object and lots of morphisms. Um, <coughs> all right. I will <coughs> erase up here and keep going, I think. So now that we've seen these like quintessential categories, let's see the sorts of categories that people are mostly used to seeing. So we have set. And the objects of set are sets. The morphisms of sets are functions. Composition is function composition. And the identity on a set is 
the identity function. All right, great. <coughs> Hopefully, everyone believes that, that these things are true, right? That, that these things hold for identity functions, that uh, composition of functions is associative. Um, yeah, and that there's, well, and that there's a set of morphisms between each function. Um, all right, let's continue on. So now we sort of have lots of categories where the objects are sets with structure on them. So we have mon, which has as objects monoids, and morphisms uh, monoid homomorphisms with composition also function composition and identities also identity functions. Because the identity function is a monoid homomorphism. Um, and the characteristic of being a homomorphism is preserved by function composition. And that's something you see when you first take a group theory course. All right, let's see. Then we have group, which has as objects groups. And as morphisms, group homomorphisms. Composition is function composition, and the identity is the identity function. All right. <laughs> and, and now we have ab, which is abelian groups. Uh, and this is the same, and this is the same, and this is the same. Great. Uh, let's see. I'm going to erase more of this. <coughs> yeah? Just for linkage, do operators there? I could not. That re would require me to have knowledge of something I do not have good knowledge of. All right. Let's do. What else? Oh, OK, I'm just going to put all these up lazily. So ring has rings, uh, has, well, uh, what do I want to say? Let's say Z linear. Is that? That's right. Yeah. Z linear maps. Uh, You just this is ring homomorphisms. I'm pretty sure that's the same as Z linear. Uh, these two are the same. All right. Um, okay. Then we have. Wait, is that the same? Maybe it's not. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna put ring homomorphism. All right. It's been a while. Uh, all right. So R modules, um, which is covered in Algebra 1, right? So everyone should know what an R module is. If you don't, it, if you think of R as a, it's a, R is a ring, and R module of R is a vector space over a ring. All right, so um, let's say left. R modules and maps are R linear transformations. And these are the same again. All right. Maybe we'll do something a little different. Uh, and we'll do POSET. So the objects are now POSETs. And the morphisms are, let's see, order preserving. Um, and I want to say that you could, I don't actually know whether if you write, I, I don't use this regularly, so I don't know if 
you write this, whether you mean like strictly order preserving or weakly order preserving, but presumably either of them would give you a perfectly good category. Uh, and these are the same. All right, what's next? Um, top. This is a good category. Topological spaces. Uh, morphisms, continuous functions, uh, and these are the same again. <coughs> All right, that's probably enough uh, examples of things that are the sets with extra structure on them. Um, now maybe we'll start doing something a little bit more interesting. Well. A couple more boring ones, and then we'll get to something more interesting. All right. So then we have categories that um, you might think of as small diagram categories, except that kind of ha already has a meaning, and so I don't want to call it that. Uh, so I'm just going to write diagrams, but I'm not going to underline it. All right. So we might have a category that has two objects and one non-identity morphism. So I could draw in the identity morphism, but what's the point? Um, I could have two objects and a morphism in each direction, a non-trivial in each direction. Um, note in particular that because these are the only um, non-trivial ones, that if you go this way and then this way, the only morphism from this object to itself is the is the identity. And similarly, if you go this way and this way, you get the identity. Um, and then a couple that are important, and we'll see why they're important later. Um, we have, say, this diagram. So this category, this is a category with three objects and two non-trivial morphisms. Um, then we have this one, where we have two morphisms like this. And then maybe we have a category that just has two objects and no non-identity morphisms. Those are, these are some diagrams that are, for various reasons, important. Um, for now, I'm going to say that this is called the walking arrow. And this is called the walking isomorphism. Um, and when we get to talking about what functors are, it will be clear why that's the case. All right. So that's enough sort of boring examples of categories. Uh, let's, maybe I can, yes. Right, so the previous, the previous category that I described is you start with a single partially ordered set, and you build a category out of it. This is the category where the objects are, are partially ordered sets. All right, I'm going to erase this now. I think this has been up for long enough. Um, Oh, these boards do not clean well. This is why chalk is better. One of the many, many reasons why chalk is better. All right. Let's talk about tangles. This is an excellent category. Um, so what are the, we want to describe this category. We should start by saying what the objects and morphisms are. And the objects of tangle, so yeah, tangles, are natural numbers. And like a civilized person, the natural numbers include 0. Um, and if you object to that, the door is over there. All right. So what's a morphism? So objects are natural numbers. So say we have a morphism. 
it's going to be like, say, f from, what have I used here? 2 to 4. All right. So a morphism here is a diagram like this. We have two dots here, and we have four dots here. And I'm going to, oh, this is complicated. Um, let's see, I want to go down here, and gap, and down here. So this is a morphism from 2 to 4, which I'm calling f. So a morphism is a diagram like this. And it's a diagram like this up to ambient isotopy, whatever that means. But what it means is that you can pull the strings around without crossing over them, basically. Um, all right. So what's composition? All right. Well, I want another map, say, from 4 to 4. Uh, and composition is that I stack these boxes. So actually, I also might add that I could have like just a circle sitting there. Because <coughs> in particular, this includes 0. And so a map from 0 to 0 is a box with no dots, a map box with no dots, and like something happening in the middle. So in particular, every knot is a morphism from 0 to 0 in this category. All right, so what's, what have I done here? <coughs> Made this unnecessarily complicated. Uh, so I can. <coughs> so actually, one way that this turns up is if you have a, is if you have a, um, a morphism from 0 to 2, it's going to look like this. And if you have a map from zero, 2 to 0, it's going to look like this. But when you compose them, you get something that goes from itself. Um, and so now if I do weird stuff on either of these morphisms, I can get knots. <coughs> Ooh. All right. Uh, so that's what composition looks like. What's the identity? This is the identity. Um, and showing, showing, like, I mean, associativity should be clear, because if you stack two of these and then put one on the bottom, it's the same as stacking two of these and then putting one on top. Um, that this is the identity is sort of intuitively clear, uh, but we would need to talk about what ambient isotopy means to really say anything. And then things would get complicated. So um, what else do I want to say? So a couple of things to notice. Well, one thing to notice is that there are only morphisms between uh, objects of the same parity in this category. So there are no objects from 2 to 5, because you would have a dot left over somewhere. Um, and all the dots have to have something coming off them, uh, which I realize I didn't actually specify, but that's a condition. All right. Uh, now we get to a category that's sort of um, going to be important, because I'm going to be talking about uh, algebraic topology a lot, because I'm an algebraic topologist. And uh, part of the reason for running this is to get people who are taking algebraic topology next semester used to algebraic topology concepts so that I don't have to read through terrible assignments. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. I mean, it happens in every course, right? With the longer you're exposed to ideas, the better you will be able to write, hopefully. All right. And now I'm going to talk about the category of chain complexes. Um, Uh, and I'm going to put um, 
the name for this piece of punctuation escapes me, but I'm going to say scare quotes uh, around chain because calling them chain complexes is really, like the chain part of it is actually quite specific to a geometric interpretation of homology. Um, and really, we're talking about complexes. In, in general, algebra, these would be called complexes. So complexes of R modules. Uh, so we'll denote this category by CHR. So R is some ring. All right. So uh, in, um, to make this sort of easier, you should just think. R equals Z, so that um, so that R modules are just abelian groups, and so actually before when I said Z linear, I, that that would apply to ab, um, not to ring. Um, all right, okay, yeah. So Z mod equals equals ab. All right, so let's see. So what are the objects in this category? The object. Uh, all right, first I'm going to write this annoying in this like annoying abstract way. I'm going to write A, well, what I use? N, obviously. D, N, for N and Z. So we have two sequences, A and Z, N, uh, A, N, and D, N, where A, N uh, is an R module, D, N, is um, an R linear transformation from uh, a n to a n plus one. Oh, I want a n minus one. It doesn't really matter, um, but for for reasons of not confusing people who are going to be doing algebraic topology, it means this. <coughs> yes. Ah, thank you. <coughs> All right. Um, so, especially for like when you're first learning algebraic topology, a lot of the examples here actually <coughs> do just use the natural numbers up. Um, but you can embed that into this by saying that everything below zero is zero. Um, all right. So, and I want to condition on these so such that uh, d squared is zero. And what I mean by that is that is d n minus 1, dn is 0 for any n. So composing any of these two maps is 0. The composition of any two maps is 0. So what actually is an object here? Well, really, it's something that looks like this. This is dn. This is dn minus 1. And everywhere along this chain, or all over along this sequence, these compose to zero. Okay. This, yes. this is an object in the category. And I foolishly wrote notes here about how to make my life easier, and then did not follow them. <coughs> so. This condition is here, so I'm just going to raise this arrow now um, because I want to say, OK, no, let's say what a morphism is. So I'm going to say over here what a morphism is. So a morphism, um, so I'm going to call this object here, I'm going to call this a bullet. Um, and where it's necessary to distinguish them, I'm going to write a here to say that these are the differentials of a. So these are called differentials. Um, <coughs> all right, so what's a morphism here? A morphism is a collection, Fn, 
from A. So this, I want a morphism from A bullet to B bullet. And this is a map from An to Bn for all integers, such that, well, you want it to commute with the differentials. So what does that mean? That means that, well, I have my Bn, Bn minus 1, Bn minus 2, and so on. And then I have these maps. So I have Fn, Fn minus 1, Fn minus 2. Here I have Dn. And now I have to distinguish these. Well, so people will not distinguish these. People will make it say it's clear from context what these should be. So usually people actually won't put like A's up here and B's down here. And so the condition is that this diagram commutes. Um, but all you need to know for this diagram to commute is you need to know that each of these squares commute. Um, and sort of the point of, of, of commutative diagrams is that it helps you understand what's going. Like a commutative diagram is really just a bunch of equations. That's what it is. You're saying that this composition is equal to this composition. But somehow, drawing this and saying this commutes is like much easier to understand what's going on than writing these equations. Especially if you have commutative diagrams that are like big cubes, and um, you would have to write down like 12 plus equations to write it all down. And you could just write a cube, and the cube tells you everything. Um, all right. so. What am I saying here? I'm saying that, uh, say, f n minus 1 composed with d a n is equal to d n b composed with f n. And so when I say that people will leave out like which thing they're talking about, you won't see these superscripts usually. It, 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 it is clear what those superscripts should be from context. And when I, so when I say, um, like, I'm really saying that the differentials commute with this map. Like, I really am swapping these things. Um, all right. Now, what's the identity? Well, it's kind of what it should be, right? Also, in commutative diagrams, people will write this to mean the identity morphism sometimes. So this is ID BN. <coughs> All right. Um, uh, I also didn't say what composition was, which I should have done before I did this. But composition is this. Composition is you, st is you stack one diagram on top of the other. Um, so what is it if I had another, more, another thing, cn, cn minus 1, cn minus 2, and I'm just going to not actually write the superscripts now because I'm lazy. All right, this is gn, this is gn minus 1, and this is gn minus 2. All right, and the composition is saying, well, just compose these maps. And that gives you a, these squares still commute. Because again, writing these things is, are just equations. So if every sort of region commutes, then sticking them together commutes. Um, I actually think that might be a bit of a lie for bigger diagrams. But uh, all right. All right, so those are, here are, here are two sort of non non-boring categories as opposed to the categories I showed earlier. Uh, <coughs> note in particular that like, not all categories need to be, the morphisms of all categories, not all categories have as morphisms functions between sets of things. Um, 
This is a little bit misleading because you can encode this in such a way, but there are examples where you cannot. Um, all right. Um, it's 11. I think we should take a five minute break. Cool. So that I can check this recording and see if it works.